Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar presentation. I'm Jessica Polk of the Current Consulting Group, and I will be conducting today's webinar. If you have any problems seeing or hearing today's webinar, please use the chat section to alert us to your issue, and we will try to resolve the problem. Any questions that you have for today's presenter can be entered into the questions section. Today's presentation is being recorded, and you will receive a link to that recording after the presentation. Um, we also would like to begin today by thanking Orisher Technologies for um, co-hosting today's presentation with us. Today's presentation is called Drug Testing During COVID-19, Essential and Smart. Um, and just a couple words about Orisher. They are a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. Their unique assays provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. The Intercept Oral Fluid Drug Test is an FDA cleared laboratory based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for nine drugs of abuse, including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, methadone, and opiates. Intercept is fast and easy to administer and is ideal for the workplace, criminal justice, drug treatment centers, clinical setting screening programs, and more. Today's presentation has qualified for continuing education credits from SHRM and CCDAP for those who attend today's presentation in its entirety. Proof of attendance and information on how to obtain the credit will be sent after the webinar. Today's presentation is presented by Bill Current of the Current Consulting Group. Bill is the president of the Current Consulting Group and a 30-year veteran of the drug testing industry. He's authored 10 books on substance abuse-related issues and regularly presents at conferences, seminars, workshops, and webinars. He's widely considered one of the leading experts on drug testing and the drug testing industry. And with that, I'm going to turn the virtual microphone over to Bill. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome to everybody who's on today's webinar. I want to also just announce that uh, Orisher informed us this morning that they are going to be uh, hosting a series of Monday mini webinars. The first one will be April 20th on sample collections, overcoming the obstacles. And of course, all of this will sort of be in the context of the current situation that we find ourselves in. Let me just start out by saying that I know that um, you know, the partially the subject of today's webinar is uh, influenced significantly by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of this material is very specific to the circumstances that we're in. It's a very serious situation. We recognize that we're not uh, presenting the information in a sense to um, ratchet up sales, so to speak, uh, but to really focus attention on the importance that drug testing plays in society in a time like this. And so, while there are a lot of very important things to worry about and, and some are you know, more important than others, um, we do have some information here that you can use if you are an employer uh, to justify continuing your drug testing program, or if you're a provider to help your, your clients understand the importance of drug testing during a national crisis. We're going to present, I'm going to present this in three sections, substance abuse trends during a national crisis, essential industries and substance abuse and safety. And I'm going to focus most of our time on part three, drug testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to talk about different testing methods and how they fit into the, to the situation that we find ourselves in. We solicited questions ahead of time and we literally got bombarded with questions. So thank you. Thank you for submitting your questions. Feel free to submit questions today during the webinar as well. I'm gonna to try to leave as much time as possible. If you'd like to go over the 60 minutes, I'll stay on the line answering questions. If you wanna submit a question that we don't get and we don't get to it, we will answer it in writing and send it out to you. Today's slides will be available. Orsher would like everybody to receive these slides and you're free to use them however you want. We also have a, a paper coming out next week that is based on today's webinar and you'll be receiving that from Orisher, and you're free to use that as well. It's copyrighted by Current Consulting Group. There's no charge for it. You can put it in your newsletter your, or whatever you wanna do with it. It's free to you, and so we hope that it'll be helpful to you. 
Okay, so let's talk about substance abuse trends during a national crisis. We know from the experience of 9-11 back in 2001 that during a time of national crisis, substance abuse increases. In particular, there were studies done in the state of New York and in New York City in particular um, that highlighted the, the, the tendency to turn to drugs and alcohol and cigarettes for that matter during the crisis. There was a study done um, that showed that substance abuse increased, uh, I shouldn't say substance abuse, that cigarette smoking, alcohol use, and marijuana use increased significantly from pre-9-11 levels. Uh, and that most of this increase continued for months later. You see that second bullet, 30% of Manhattan residents said they drank more alcohol, smoked more cigarettes, and used more marijuana in the first month after 9-11. And that number only dropped slightly to 27% a half a year later. And so there were a number of different studies that were done that showed that nationally, but particularly in New York, um, drug abuse, cigarette use, alcohol abuse went up during this period of time. Now, this was sent in to me by one of our followers. This is from an, uh, a television news report in Indianapolis. And, and on their website, the headline said, study one in four Hoosiers, Indiana residents, are drinking while working from home. We know a lot of people are working from home right now. And so the study said, and this is just quoted directly from them, one in four Hoosiers are day drinking even while working from home. This is a study that was done by alcohol.org, and it's, they surveyed 3,000 working Americans, and 26% of Indiana workers admitted to drinking alcohol while working from home. Hawaiians had the highest rate at 67%, and um, people from Arkansas were the lowest at 8%. If you go to alcohol.org, you'll see the study there, and there'll be a map, and you can just put your clicker, hover your clicker over the, or the cursor over the um, one note, and it'll just give you the percentage. I think uh, Virginia and New Hampshire, I believe, were second to Hawaii at 50% each, and then it went below from there. But the substance abuse issue, uh, people self-medicating, turning to drugs and alcohol during this crisis has already, ha it's already happening. Um, <clears throat> a report from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Associated Press, uh, last week showed that U.S. sales of alcoholic beverages rose 55% in the week ending March 21st, and this was from a study done by Nielsen. Spirits like tequila, gin, premixed cocktails were number one, with sales jumping 75% compared to the same period a year ago. Wine sales up 66%, beer up 42%, and the majority of the sales were our online sales. Marijuana in many states that have legalized it, especially for medical marijuana, are, have designated marijuana or declared marijuana to be an essential medicine. And so in many states, perhaps in all states with medical marijuana laws, I haven't researched it to know for sure, states with medical marijuana laws have allowed the marijuana stores and dispensaries to remain open during the pandemic. And so according to e-commerce platform Jane Technologies, they reported that the average store revenue in March was up between 52 and 130 percent compared to January of this year. So not compared to a year ago. There's already been an increase since January of 2019. But March compared to January of 2020 saw that increase in different places in the country between 52 and 130 percent. And online buyers increased by 142 percent. And as you can see from the other three bullets, there are studies that are showing and reports that are showing increases in uh, beverages and edibles uh, in different places like in California. Um, you see the last bullet there, uh, a demand for cannabis in Florida, according to one marketing firm, uh, an increase of 36%. So throughout the country, people are drinking more, alcohol sales up dramatically, and smoking more marijuana. I mean, we're assuming, right, that they're not buying it just to put it on the on the shelf, but they're actually doing it. And this comes at a time when drug abuse in the country was already on the rise. So according to SAMHSA, 
there was about 53.2 million people, 12 and older, in 2018. That's This is a reflection of the latest study available from the federal government who were past year illicit drug users compared to, and that came out to 19.4%. Put it another way, one in five people aged 12 and older used illicit drugs in the past year, according to SAMHSA. Now, the percentage of the population, look at that last bullet, the percentage of the population in 2018 who used illicit drugs in the past year was higher than the percentages in 2015 and 2016, similar to 2017, but even higher than 2017 as well. So at a time when drug abuse was already on the rise, we find ourselves in this national crisis and we already see evidence that alcohol use and marijuana use are increasing. And, and the, the increase in drug abuse is fueled by the legalization of marijuana. So marijuana has been legalized in 34 states for medicinal use and 11 states for uh, recreational use. All 11 states with recreational marijuana, marijuana laws had already improved, uh, approved it for medicinal use. So legal marijuana fueling an increase in drug abuse across the country, and then we get hit by the pandemic. These are just some slides you're gonna have access to them that show the significant increase in marijuana from 15% in 2017 to 15.9% in 2018. That is what statisticians would call a significant or a statistically significant increase at a time when abuse of psychotherapeutic drugs is going down, use and perhaps abuse of marijuana is going up. And it's true in um, all of these different years by, um, you know, different percentages, but among adults 26 and older, past month is the first set of bars, past year or daily use, uh, past year daily or almost daily use is the second set of bars. In other words, you can see that from 2015 to 2018 in that second set of bars over there, that almost daily use of, of marijuana it has been increasing from 1.9% to 2.8%, from 3.9 million to 5.9 million. And then if you break it down by mental illness, you can see that there's a, a significant increase in illicit drug use, period, but then marijuana, opioid use, and in all drug categories. And the reason I put this slide on here is that during a national crisis, during a time of, of, um, of national crisis, mental illness becomes highlighted by the stress and the depression and the discouragement that people begin to feel. And that's why you're starting to see medical experts in the news talking about um, the potential for an increase in suicides and other mental illness related issues, and then add to that substance abuse. And so you can see here that substance use, and that's the term the federal government use, uses, is more frequent among adults with mental illnesses. And now we're gonna see an increase in that as well. So let's talk about essential industries. Drug abuse is on the rise. We're in a time of national crisis, and we know that in a time of national crisis, more people turn to drug and alcohol as a way to self-medicate through the, the pain and the depression and the discouragement that they're experiencing. Now, certain industries by the federal government and at the state level, depending on the circumstances, have been deemed to be essential jobs during the pandemic. And we all rely on these types of services. So nobody's debating whether or not these are actually essential occupations. Some of them may be more so than others, and this is just a list of 14. But there are certain industries, there are certain occupations that are essential given what we're going through. And so here's the, the list from the federal government. Your state may have a, an expanded list. I know here in Florida, we have an expanded list. And some of those, let's go back one slide. Some of these uh, occupations that have been deemed essential also are among the industries, according to SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, according to SAMHSA, that tend to have higher rates of drug abuse. And so you can see accommodations and food services at the top of the list. Um, others, as you see on here, uh, uh, construction, occupations associated with uh, substance abuse, et cetera. Now, here's the list according to SAMHSA again, from the same report of industries that have the highest rates of alcohol misuse, mining, construction, accommodations and food service, utility industry. And then here is a report from Quest Diagnostics, a major drug testing laboratory of the industries that 
are showing the highest rates of positivity trends over the last four or five years. So retail trade is one of six sectors that saw year over year double digit increases in positivity between 2015 and 2018. Five of these experienced an overall four year increase in the general US workforce positive positivity, more than double that of the national average. Transportation and warehousing, wholesale trade, retail trade, a lot of retail trade of course has been shut down. Construction, administrative support, waste management and remediation services. So we have some industries that have been deemed essential or occupations within them that have been deemed essential. And many of them come from the list of industries that have the highest rates of substance abuse. So compare that, those lists, to the industries with the largest number of workplace accidents, or excuse me, injuries from workplace accidents the service sector, transportation and shipping, manufacturing and production, installation, maintenance and repair, and there's construction again on the list. Now here in Florida, construction projects are still going on all around us. Now I haven't been out of my house in three weeks for the most part, but I have friends and relatives that are in the construction industry and they're still going to work every day. I don't know if that's the safest, best thing to do, but construction has been deemed and certain types of projects that were already underway have been deemed essential here in Florida during the, the lockdown, the statewide lockdown. So you see the industries with the highest rates of substance abuse juxtaposed with the industries or occupations that have been deemed uh, essential during the pandemic. And then you compare it to the industries that typically have the highest rates of workplace injuries due to accidents. Marijuana tops the list of the industries that have seen the greatest percentage increase. So transportation and warehousing and other services like public administration, number one at 33%. Construction on the list again, wholesale trade, manufacturing, food services, et cetera, on the list. So you see the increase in positivities from marijuana use, and you see a direct correlation with the industries that have been deemed essential during the pandemic and that are also uh, experiencing traditionally the highest rates of substance abuse and then add to that the fact that we're in this situation we're in this circumstance where many many people more than usual are turning to drugs and alcohol to deal with the stress of the times okay i've covered a lot of information quickly you're going to have these slides so all of the slides, let me go back and show you. All of these slides will tell you the source down at the bottom. And if you want to, you can just look it up online um, and go directly to the study or the report that I'm referring to so that you can look it up as well. When you get the paper that Orsher is going to send out to you, it has all these statistics and studies and all the references in the footnotes with the actual URL to go to to find the exact study that I'm referring to. Okay, if you have questions about any of those studies, and I may have slurred a few of them as I was speeding through it because I wanted to get to part three and then leave plenty of time because I you wouldn't believe the, the, the amount of questions that we have to, to today for today's webinar. Um, and they're very specific questions and I'm gonna try to deal with them as best I can. But I wanted to spend as much time as possible in part three, but if you have any questions about part one and part two, please let me know. Again, you're free to use these slides any way that you would like. So let's cover a few essential facts right now. And this is a, this, you know, this whole situation is changing regularly. Okay. But I would suggest under the circumstances, given the fact that drug abuse was already on the, on the rise, that during a time of national crisis, people turn to drugs and alcohol abuse, or drugs and alcohol, excuse me, and more than normal, and that according to the post 9-11 studies that were done, this increase in turning to drugs and alcohol continues for months after the end of the crisis, and that certain industries right now and occupations that have been deemed essential are those that traditionally, historically have the highest rates of substance abuse, now is not the time to stop drug testing or to curtail drug testing. The federal government continues to require drug testing of employers in certain safety sensitive industries, such as transportation, 
I'm going to talk about the DOT notices that have come out. So I know that there's been some leniency that's been um, put out there. I'm going to clarify a few things so that we're all on the same page. But generally speaking, unless something happened in the last 30 minutes before I, I went on this webinar, DOT is still requiring drug and alcohol testing. State drug testing laws that mandate drug testing or that regulate how, when, and who drug testing, the who of drug testing, so far have not been suspended. We did a, a nationwide state-by-state -state review yesterday here at Current Consulting Group to verify any states that maybe have suspended drug testing or drug testing requirements as part of a workers' compensation premium discount law or an industry-specific law like the, um, the Illinois Public Works Law or Kentucky Mining Law, et cetera. We didn't find anything. So if you know of something, please write it into the, the Q&A section so that we can all share that information, but we didn't find anything. So state drug testing law is still in effect. If you're drug testing in a particular state, you must comply with the state drug testing law even during the pandemic. Lab-based urine drug testing still works. The traditional method of testing that most companies for many years have relied on still in place, still works. There are certain challenges right now to getting a urine collection done. And so alternative testing methods may help employers overcome those obstacles that they're experiencing right now with getting a urine collection done at a offsite facility and continue to be able to drug test. We're gonna talk about that, okay? I'm not gonna spend hours talking about the DOT regulations and these notices that have come out, except to say that ODAPSI put out a statement on March 23rd that said that basically DOT regulated employers must continue to comply with the applicable DOT training and testing requirements. In other words, drug and alcohol testing required under the DOT regulations remains in effect, as well as the supervisor training requirements and the employee education training requirements that may be required under each of the different modes. Those stay in effect right now. However, DOT has said they recognize that compliance to the latter of the law may be very difficult, if not, not possible at this point. And so they're encouraging covered employers to make reasonable efforts to locate urine collections resources in particular, and that perhaps you may want to consider mobile collection services to meet those needs if you can find those, okay? In some cases, not even mobile collectors are available in certain areas. Some states have been hit harder than other states by the coronavirus, and it's even more challenging in those states. We're told, anecdotally, from the information we're getting from clients, that it's becoming more and more difficult to find even mobile collectors that will come to your, web, to your workplace. I have talked to my clients, though, that are TPAs in different parts of the country, here in Florida, Arizona, and other places, where they say they're still providing their services and that sometimes they'll get a phone call from somebody who's tried many, many different locations uh, and been turned away until they got to that, that TPA who said, yes, we can help you with this. If you're unable to do anything at all for any reason, especially when it comes to random testing, document the reasons why. Be prepared to defend yourself when this thing comes to an end so that Whatever the circumstances were that prevented you from doing this or that, you have it in writing. You can you have a paper trail as to why you did that. Let me go back and just say, you can go to um, the link on this page and find the uh, various modal uh, statements that have been issued from FMCSA, FTA, FRA, et cetera, okay? I'm just gonna use one example, the, uh, you know, the Federal Motor Carrier that's coming up in a minute, but there was counsel on there at guidance on the ODAPSI statement for providers of drug and alcohol testing services. As a collector, BAT, laboratory, MRO, or SAP, you should continue to provide services to DOT regulated employers if it is possible to do so in accordance with state or local mandates related to COVID-19. So in other words, you've got these federal regulations, they call for X, Y, and Z, but you may be facing certain conditions, regulations, guidelines, uh, restrictions in your state related to COVID-19 that would interfere with doing that. Document why. Make sure that you create the paper trail. If there are any concerns, second bullet, about COVID-19 when testing or interacting with employees, please follow your company policy, DOT says. Directions from state and local officials and guidance from the CDC. 
In other words, DOT is trying to be as reasonable as possible on this while continuing to require drug testing to ensure safe transportation. Now, the FMCSA, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, has put out specific guidelines. I'm not going to go through all of these. They take up the next two or three slides, but I do want to emphasize a couple of points because you're going to see as I scan through here that all the different testing circumstances are covered in the guidance that came out from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So random testing, for example, you are required by 49 CFR 382.305K to ensure that the dates for administering random alcohol and controlled substance tests are spread reasonably throughout the calendar year. That gives you some latitude there. You can move things around a little bit if there's some disruption to the normal uh, way in which uh, you would get these tests done or you would provide these services due to the national emergency. But it says, and it's in, in orange right there in the middle, you should make up the tests that you're unable to do now by the end of the year so that you can reach your 50% random rate if you fall under the FMCSA regulations. Here's something very important though. This one, I, this last bullet I put in bold, pre-employment testing. If you are unable to conduct a pre-employment controlled substances test in accordance with 49 CFR 382.301A, you cannot allow a prospective employee to perform DOT safety sensitive functions until you receive a negative pre-employment test result, unless the exception in 49 CFR 382.301B applies. Let me say that generally speaking, that's not going to apply. But in this instance, you cannot allow an employee or a new worker to function in a safety sensitive occupation unless you have a negative pre-employment test result. Scan forward to return to duty, somebody coming back from having tested positive in the, in the past. In accordance with 49 CFR 40.305A, you must not allow the driver to perform any safety sensitive functions as defined in the regulations until you have a return to duty test that is conducted and is negative. So there are two circumstances, pre-employment and return to duty, where DOT is saying to you, you still must have a negative test result before you can allow individuals in those two circumstances uh, to conduct safety sensitive transportation related duties, okay? That's the, the counsel from ODAPSI and as an example of the modes from FMCSA. Now, there's lots of different drug testing methods, okay? There's urine testing, there's POCT urine testing, point of collection or rapid result, instant disposable devices testing, there's header testing, there's lab-based oral fluid testing, and there's also rapid result oral fluid testing. So in this day and age, you've got lots of different options. Under the DOT regulations right now, lab-based urine testing is the only testing method available to you. We know because SAMHSA has endorsed lab-based oral fluid testing that DOT regulations for lab-based oral fluid testing are coming someday in the near future. And by near, you know, that's a relative term. Right now, it's urine testing through a laboratory, a certified laboratory only, with all the other regulations that apply from the collection to, you know, consequences when somebody tests positive. But right now, in non-DOT settings, you have, you have lots of different options that are available to you, some that may be more conducive with the circumstances that we find ourselves in and some that may be less complicated given the concern about exposure to the virus. And so we'll talk about those in a minute. One of the things you wanna keep in mind as you're thinking about maybe using a different testing technology is the window of detection, whether a certain testing method will meet your window of detection needs. Oral fluid, as you can see the blue line there, is a shorter window of detection then urine and certainly hair, but the window of detection opens up immediately after somebody uses the drug. That's because with oral fluid, you're typically testing for the parent drug and not just a metabolite of the drug. With urine, we're waiting several hours for the drug to metabolize. And so it's, it's not days until a drug is detectable in urine, but it's a period of hours. And then that, that usage will appear in the urine sample. If you're looking for a recent use detector, then you want oral fluid. If you're looking for a longer window of detection, then you're, you're probably looking at urine. Hair testing has a longer lag time before the drug becomes detectable in the hair sample, but then it's detectable for weeks and weeks, up to three months 
after the person used the drug. These are things that you have to take in, to, into consideration. Now, lab-based urine testing has been the standard for more than 30 years. And the majority of all drug tests are lab-based urine tests. There's also POCT urine testing as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. But all certified laboratories are certified to, to process urine samples. We're, we're in the process now of laboratories becoming certified to process oral fluid samples. So all of the SAMHSA certified laboratories are certified for urine drug testing. And that's good. And, and it's the testing method that we've come to rely on and trust for many years, legally defensible, scientifically accurate, and no problem with it at all. Except right now, we're having problems getting urine collections done. And so DOT is recommending mobile collection services um, for compliance with the DOT regulations. Outside of the DOT regulations, there may be other ways to collect a, a urine sample so that you're not dealing with an offsite collection facility that maybe is closed right now or maybe is not collecting uh, urine samples for drug testing. Maybe their hours uh, don't match up with your work hours or whatever the challenges, is, challenges are that you're running into. You may be experiencing problems right now getting urine collections done. It doesn't mean there's a problem with urine testing generally. Under these circumstances, though, there may be some inherent qualities to the process of a urine test that may be creating obstacles for you. So under these circumstances, lab-based oral fluid testing may be an alternative that you want to consider. We know already that it's been endorsed by the federal government, right? SAMHSA put out some put out final guidelines uh, on on uh, oral fluid drug testing through a laboratory, and I've got a few slides coming up on that. Lab-based oral fluid testing does address some of the challenges that our employers are dealing with right now. You're not, you're not required to use an offsite collection facility or a secured bathroom, restroom, for example, to collect an oral fluid sample. Those problems go away because oral fluid collections are generally fairly easy to do Employees can be trained, supervisors can be trained to oversee the collection process. It's, it's for the most part donor driven, but supervised by somebody who's been trained to, um, to oversee the oral fluid collection. And so you're not dealing with collection sites that have closed or reduced their hours, et cetera, et cetera. On-site oral fluid collections are fairly easy to do. The donor and the collector can still maintain six feet of distance per the CDC regulations and the collector wearing protective mask and gloves, maybe even a gown, um, can oversee that process without coming into direct contact with the donor. Drugs are detectable, as I said earlier, in a oral fluid sample within minutes after usage. And this may be particularly important right now where you're, where you're bringing people into the workplace on a daily basis and wanting to make sure that nobody's under the influence of drugs at a time when more people are using drugs. Now, we won't go through all of these in great detail, but if you did a side-by-side -side comparison of a urine collection and an oral fluid collection, you would see advantages and some challenges to both methods, okay? But generally speaking, there are certain things that are involved in a proper urine collection that are just challenging to do right now. There are, there, there's the proximity of the donor and the collector, the trying to ensure that restrooms are sanitized and safe, especially when lots of different people are going into a particular restroom or there's a lot of people lined up to, to provide or to void a sample. Um, it, it could be difficult to maintain the six feet of separation per CDC. Um, and, and there are just other processes, not, not the least of which is the fact that under the circumstances, some facilities, some companies that would typically provide this service for you are just not available to do it. So off-site collection services are not necessary with the oral fluid collection. The entire collection process, even with six feet of distance, can be completely observable, eliminating concerns about drug test cheating, especially at this time. The donor or the, uh, uh, the administrator of the test with the protective gloves and all the other protective uh, wear <clears throat> creates a, a, a safer environment. Now, all of this said, one of the questions I got, I'll just jump to one of the questions was, should we be switching to oral fluid testing right now? Now, I don't know who submitted that question, but I would be very reluctant to make some type of a blank, blanket 
all-encompassing generic recommendation like that. There, there are a lot of things to take into consideration, and it may not be a matter of switching from urine to oral fluid, but a matter of adding oral fluid to an existing urine testing program. Remember, this pandemic will end, and when it does, we need to be ready. And one of the things we may want to consider that maybe we didn't have time for in the past was enhancing our program, our drug-free workplace program, to include alternative testing methods like lab-based oral fluid testing so that we can meet today's needs and be prepared for what the workplace is going to look like when this is all over. Remember, there are going to be millions of people uh, looking for jobs when the pandemic ends and when the lockdown ends, and pre-employment drug testing will be more important than ever. Those who say that pre-employment testing is dead are dead wrong. Pre-employment testing will probably be more important than ever when this thing ends because we want to still secure the safety of our workplaces. As more people come back to work, they will be coming back with experience, more experience using drugs. And from the post-9-11 studies, we know that that trend will continue for months after the, the, um, the emergency, the national emergency ends. Now, I've been asked a couple of questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of work them into this slide here about just other ways to get collections done. So one person uh, emailed me and said that for insurance collections, so in the, you know, if you apply for an insurance policy, you have to provide a sample for it, and you can, you can easily do that oral fluid collection via some type of video observation using Skype or FaceTime or Zoom with a trained observer. And so the oral fluid kit is sent to the applicant. The insurance agent uh, connects with the applicant online to help them get their application done and then observes the collection of an oral fluid sample and the sealing of the sample in an envelope so it can be shipped back to a lab to ship to a laboratory for testing. Now, that's that's one way that you could go about doing that. And there are reports that other industries like behavioral health and drug treatment settings are perhaps doing this as well. Could that become a new normal in the future? I don't know. There's lots of uh, restrictions and guidance on how collections are done. But surely there must be other ways to do these things that are more cost effective and under these circumstances safer. I'm not saying do it this way. I'm saying that there are people that are already doing it this way. And it may be one of the things that you want to consider so that you can still get, say, for example, pre-employment drug testing done if you're hiring in one of these essential industries during the pandemic so that you're not hiring people without drug testing them first. Can't do that for DOT, right? Because DOT doesn't allow oral fluid testing yet, but we know that the vast majority of testing is not DOT mandated testing. The next three slides have to do with the SAMHSA guidelines. I'm not gonna go through them. They're here though for your reference. We know that they, they came out in October, 2019. There's gonna be about a 12 to 18 month implementation period for laboratories and MROs and others to get up to speed for labs to get certified. So there were lots of reasons why DOT decided to allow lab-based oral fluid testing. They're here on this slide. The one I like the best is just the science. And this is a direct quote from the, um, from the Federal Register notice that came out in October. The scientific basis for the use of oral fluid as an alternative specimen for drug testing has now been broadly established and the advances in the use of oral fluid in detecting drugs have made it possible for this alternative specimen to be used in federal programs with the same level of confidence that has been applied to the use of urine. So if your concern had to do with the science of oral fluid testing, I think that that concern has been satisfied. So there are lots of different things that you wanna consider um, during the pandemic. Lab-based oral fluid testing may be one of them, but another one may be point of collection testing or rapid result testing. This involves the use of a one-time use disposable device. They're available for urine samples. They're available for oral fluid samples as well. There are some state restrictions that may apply here and there. So you gotta be careful that you're, you're making sure that you're in compliance with the state laws that apply to you. I've been doing state drug testing law issues since the beginning of my career back when I was at the US Chamber of Commerce. I can tell you that the most frequent question I get asked is, I'm in multiple states, I'm headquartered in Iowa, but I'm in 30 states, which state law do I comply with? And the answer has always been the same. It's the simplest answer you can come up with, which is all of them. You must comply with all 30 states laws. And so you may run into some situations where there are 
maybe restrictions is not the right word, but conditions that have been placed on the use of point of collection devices, either for oral fluid or urine. You can work around those by complying with them, but it doesn't mean that you can't do POCT testing in a state that has some guidance or conditions that have been placed. You just need to make sure that you're using you, typically an FDA cleared device that covers the drugs that are required in your state at the cutoff levels that are required in your state and that any other conditions for the collection process itself are being complied with in your program. Update your drug testing policy to reflect the addition of lab-based oral fluid or instant oral fluid, instant urine testing, but this also represents an alternative that you may want to consider when it comes to drug testing and maintaining your drug testing program during the, the pandemic. I've been a friend of, uh, or a fan of point of collection testing for many, many years. There are some really great devices. The technology has advanced significantly over the years. Without endorsing any particular product or manufacturer, I can say there's a lot of good uh, product on the market now. But there's also, and there always have been, some some kind of inferior products on the market that are I just wouldn't recommend them. So make sure that you do your homework, look at the product insert or the package insert for the product that you're going to use, and make sure that the provider can answer your questions, particularly that you can use this device or whatever the device is in the state where you're where you're doing business or the states where you're conducting business. There could be some restrictions in states that offer uh, uh, workers' compensation premium discounts like Tennessee or Georgia or Florida. Those laws typically are very um, narrow in the types of drug testing that'll, that they'll allow. But outside of those restrictions, outside of those quote unquote voluntary laws that offer certain benefits like a workers' comp premium discount, outside of those laws, typically like here in Florida, we don't have a mandatory drug testing law that applies generally like the state of Iowa does. And so outside of our voluntary workers' comp premium discount law here in Florida, which is very flexible, one of the best in the country, there are no restrictions. You can use lab-based oral fluid testing, POCT urine, POCT oral fluid, but confer with the state law to make sure that you're in complete compliance. POCT represents an alternative during these times when it's difficult to get collections done. And as you notice, there, it's available, there's technology, there are products available for both urine and oral fluid. And another way to go is what's called instrumented point of collection testing. So if you're uncomfortable having yourself or any of your employees read a, um, a result from an instant device, one of these single use disposable devices, then you can use an instrumented test that will um, give you um, a result that's generated by the instrument, by the machine, if you will. And so it's usually sort of a desktop or countertop machine. Some of them are very, very compact and um, don't take up a lot of space, but you would collect a, a urine sample, for example, uh, a urine sample, for example, in a cup, and you would insert the cup into the machine. You're not pouring the urine from, from the cup into the machine or anything like that but the cup is designed to be inserted with the sample in it so that the machine, the instrument, is actually analyzing the contents of the cup and providing a yes or no response to you. At the cutoff levels that have been established with that particular cup, testing for those drugs, um, you're able to, the, the instrument is able to tell you qualitatively whether there's, a, there's drugs in the, the sample that you've collected. It's gonna give you a yes or no response. If it's yes, you send it to a laboratory for a confirmation test using uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and then if it's confirmed positive, you get verified by an MRO. But if it's negative, you're, you're good to go right there on the spot. And the instrument did the actual reading of the result for you. One other thing to bring up before I get to these questions, I'm right on time. I wanted to allow about 15 minutes for Q&A is saliva alcohol testing. So saliva alcohol testing is approved. Certain devices have been approved by DOT. They're on the conforming products list. Um, and you can use saliva alcohol testing as a screen for compliance with the DOT regulations. Okay, so if you're dealing with a collection facility or some other agency and they're unable to provide breathalyzers right now, evidentiary, evidentiary breath, 
testing devices than an alternative to stay in compliance with the DOT regulations or to me or to continue your alcohol screening program outside of the DOT regulations is saliva alcohol testing. And because Orishers are sponsored today, I mentioned that the QED A150 saliva alcohol test available from Orisher is DOT approved. It would have to be a device like that that's on the conforming products list, the CPL. Otherwise, you can't do that. EBT is still required for confirmation of a screen positive, but you can use an approved saliva alcohol screen um, as the preliminary test before an EBT confirmation. And if it's negative, then you don't have to send it, you don't have to uh, conduct the EBT. Okay, there's some, there's some alternatives, okay? In conclusion, before I get to the Q&A, Substance abuse will likely increase in the coming months. Industries and occupations that are deemed essential, some of them are on the list of those industries that have the higher rates of substance abuse and accidents. And employers may be questioning the, port the importance of drug testing during the COVID-19 pandemic, but I would argue that drug testing is just as important now, maybe more so. And in the coming months, when the pandemic ends, when the lockdowns are lifted, when society starts going back to work, and there's some indication now that some industries are going to be allowed to go back to work in the coming weeks, in the next few weeks, that drug testing will be essential because substance abuse will have increased during the national emergency. And we're going to be interviewing mi perhaps millions of people who are going to be looking for work. Thank heavens they're going to be able to come back and try to find work. But we want to make sure that we remain committed to our drug-free workplace efforts and programs. And drug testing is one of the ways that you can do that and there are alternatives in addition to, not necessarily in place of your existing testing program that may help you get through the pandemic and then prepare you for the time when the pandemic is over. Okay, so I wanna to get to some questions. And before I, I ask Jessica which questions were submitted by our attendees today, um, let me take a few that came in before, beforehand. Um, now, some of these I'm not going to be able to answer. I'm going to need to research them, but we've already started working on that, researching the answers to these questions. So first question, is there guidance on how employers should handle collection sites refusing drug testing services? Currently, we are being told to document all attempts and try to locate alternative sites. Aside from exhausting all resources, are there other best practices we can try as a company? If you're talking about DOT regulations, I defer to the guidance that's been provided by each of the modes. I used the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration as an example, but all of the modes, including the Coast Guard, have put out guidance on uh, complying with their regulations during the pandemic. Uh, outside of the DOT regulations, depending on the state laws, but most state laws permit, you can look at POCT testing with urine or oral fluid, or you could look at lab-based oral fluid testing as a way to continue to test when you're not able to get urine collections done. Uh, remote video observed collections, like I talked about with the insurance industry, depending on your market, may be something else that you want to consider. Uh, if you if you want to go into more detail on that, email me at bcurrent at currentconsultinggroup.com, and we can go back and forth, and I can answer your question in more detail. Will the FAA be more lenient testing requirements, timelines, on employers who are trying to conduct random testing in the states that have been hit hardest, New York and California? During the pandemic. And I've not seen any specific guidance um, from DOT on any specific states. Um, so I can't say that that, that is the case, but I, but I would advise you to go to the, the modal guidance that's been provided and, and follow it and document. And if you're unable to do things in California and New York because it's just become, you know, 99% impossible, Document, document your efforts, why you weren't able to get random testing done, for example, and be prepared to meet the requirement, FMCSA 50%, by the end of the year, meaning you're going to have sort of more random tests done after the lockdowns are lifted. However, if it's, po if it's uh, return to duty or pre-employment testing, then you must follow the regulations. And so far, they've not allowed a lot of leniency there. If you can't get the test done, you can't get it done but you can't allow somebody to, um, to um, perform safety sensitive transportation duties until you have a negative test result. What is our company's liability in requiring an employee to go for a random drug and alcohol test based on a customer or DOT requirement 
when they live in a town with strict stay-at-home mandates, and then we send them anyway, and later they test positive for COVID-19? Well, I left the answer to that on my form here blank. I would, I would refer to your local council to ask them for their advice on that particular, and I got this question several times, so um, I'm not trying to skip it, but I think the, and, and Yvette Farnsworth, one of the attorneys in the current consulting group is researching this issue in more detail by state. So I can't answer it in great detail for any specific state in this moment, but I would advise you to seek advice from your council and, and document any concerns why somebody would say, for example, refuse to uh, go for a random drug test. And there's guidance uh, in the modal um, guidance that's been issued so far on that very issue. Um, so I would say be careful, uh, comply with the state laws that apply to you, seek advice from your, from your corporate attorney and document everything. If you can't do it, if you don't wanna do it, or for whatever reason, I'm not advising you either way, but I would say, be careful and document everything. And a lot of the questions I have here, my answer has been document, document, document. Should an employee working from home be required to leave their home to go for a drug and alcohol test? Again, confer with your attorney, document everything, especially if it's a DOT test, understanding that a pre-employment DOT test, a negative result is still required before you can put that person to work. Now, here's an interesting question. I know at this time that non-DOT random testing has stopped, but what about DOT random testing? What are the rules during COVID-19? I do not want to send employees out for testing and possibly risk them to exposure. So that's a question that overlaps with some of the other questions, but I've not, we, we did a complete 50 state review yesterday. We haven't found a state that's issued any um, guidance that would suggest suspending random testing for non-DOT situations. Uh, if you're aware of something, please let us know for your particular state or states, but we've not found anything on that. But again, random testing outside of the DOT um, regulations is generally by company authority. Now you may fall under, as I mentioned earlier, Illinois uh, public works law that requires random testing. It sort of mirrors DOT. Um, or you may be part of Tennessee's voluntary drug-free workplace program that um, requires random testing in order to qualify for a workers' comp premium discount here in Florida, for example. Um, and so I would, I would recommend that you consult with the, the state organizations, the workers' comp board in your state, for example, on that particular issue. But generally speaking, outside of those limited circumstances, random drug testing is conducted by company authority when it's not a DOT mandated test. And so you make those decisions whether you're gonna conduct random testing. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, you may choose to limit it or suspend it. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying that non-DOT random drug testing in most, in most situations is by company authority and you make those decisions. Okay, is oral fluid testing safe with COVID-19? I think here the key is the collection process and whether you're doing a urine collection or an oral fluid collection, the the CDC guidelines are imperative. Follow those guidelines as close as you can to make sure that you're doing everything possible uh, to protect the collector as well as the donors who come in. Um, it's safe in terms of uh, you know, you know, getting the sample to the laboratory and having it analyzed, um, but the collection process is the key. And I would advise you to follow CDC guidance on that process, making sure that you're maintaining the the minimum six feet distance between individuals. And in some cases, maybe even looking at this uh, suggestion that, that one of our viewers sent in about doing video observed collections. I, you know, I think we'd have to develop some guidance on that to know for sure how best to do that. Um, should people switch from oral fluid to, co uh, to um, from oral fluid to urine or from urine to oral fluid during COVID-19? I just really would be uncomfortable making such a recommendation in such a sort of generic blanket format other than to say, consider your situation and look at the different options that are available to you so that you can make sure that you're meeting your drug-free workplace needs and keeping your workers safe, the workers that are being tested and perhaps the workers that are observing tests. If it's a post-accident test, right, you're sending the worker to an off-site collection site to for a urine collection, but you're also sending somebody else with them, right? Because you're not going to send them 
there by themselves, that would be um, unwise to do that. So make sure that you're in compliance with your company policy under all circumstances and keeping everybody as safe as possible. Jessica, what questions have we received? I've got tons more here, but let's make sure we get to a couple that have been sent in by our audience today. Great, Bill. Thank you so much for all of that information. We have had um, several questions come in during today's presentation. Uh, some of them uh, were duplicates to questions that you've gone over already. Um, so that's been great. Um, one question that was posed um, that maybe you could clarify again for us. It, it mentioned oral fluid testing. Um, and let me just go ahead and read it to you. It says, I thought that even though federal oral fluid guidelines have been published, we cannot use it yet because there are no certified labs yet. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. So DOT or SAMHSA said there would be a 12 to 18 month implementation period. During that implementation period, laboratories would go through the certification process, collection devices would go through the FDA clearance process, MROs would get certified to, uh, trained I should say, to, um, to do their functions with oral fluid samples. So we're not to that point yet. And keep in mind that the, the oral fluid mandatory guidelines that were issued back in October only apply to federal government employers. So right now they don't apply to the private sector. But keep in mind also that some states have drug testing laws that defer to the SAMHSA guidelines for drug testing. And up until October, that was just for you know, lab-based urine testing. Now, of course, we've got the oral fluid mandatory guidelines that can serve now as a blueprint for companies that are testing outside of DOT mandated testing. And so I don't think that generally there's a reason to wait um, because oral, lab-based oral fluid testing has been in practice for many years now. Lots of companies use lab-based oral fluid testing. Some very well-known companies um, rely on it. And it's very popular in certain industries. So there's no need to wait. Um, I would recommend to the extent possible, though, using the oral fluid mandatory guidelines, which right now only apply to the federal government as sort of a blueprint for setting up your program. Uh, but the fact that that implementation period is still in process shouldn't be a hindrance to implementing lab-based oral fluid testing if you want to uh, outside of the DOT regulations or any other federally mandated drug testing program. Great, that's a great explanation, Bill. Um, another comment came in saying, we are seeing more issues with breath alcohol testing. Um, I know that on the upcoming events, April 27th, alcohol testing for DOT and non-DOT compliance, um, we'll probably go into more detail about this, but could you give us just a little bit more information about that? Well, saliva alcohol screens have been approved by DOT since the beginning of time, so to speak, right, in DOT time. Um, but only certain devices appear on the conforming products list that's put out by NHTSA. Um, so you want to make sure that you're first and foremost, that you can do that in your state under your state's drug and alcohol testing law, and that you're using a product that's been approved uh, and appears on the conforming products list that's put out by the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Aside from that, uh, saliva alcohol testing is pretty simple to do. I mean, there, you're not, there's not a, an evidentiary breath testing device that's involved. There's no calibrations involved, things of that nature. It's a fairly simple test to, to conduct. It's economical, uh, but it's not an evidentiary breath test. And so if somebody does test positive with a, a saliva test, then you know, under compliance with the DOT regulations, you would you would want to, you would have to get it confirmed using an EBT. Uh, outside of the DOT regulations, I would refer you to your state drug and alcohol testing law. Thank you for that information. Um, one last question, and then I think we're gonna, I'm gonna wrap us up. Um, is there a list of safety sensitive positions that people could access? Okay, that is a great question. Um, some states, some state drug testing laws do include guidance on that issue. Um, Vermont's one, an example of a state. I think Maine is another one. I'd have to go back and check. Um, a lot of these states that have created um, 
legal marijuana laws, especially the recreational laws, but even some of the medicinal marijuana laws, they do have language in their laws that, uh, that create some protections against discrimination for legal users of marijuana. But there's usually in these laws some type of safety sensitive carve out, they're typically called, where they will list safety sensitive occupations. Illinois is a good example. New York City is another great example where they will actually list certain safety sensitive occupations that are excluded from the restrictions in the state's marijuana law, meaning that if there's some restriction on pre-employment testing for THC in a particular state, then uh, these safety sensitive occupations listed in the law are excluded from those restrictions. So one, check your state drug testing law to see if it provides any guidance there. Two, if you have a marijuana law, check that, it'll provide some guidance. But three, be reasonable. Um, look at the types of jobs that people do for the occupations that they're in and put it in your policy. Be specific, put it in writing in your drug testing policy and educate your supervisors and your employees so that they know precisely what to do and which occupations can be considered safety sensitive according to your company policy. Now, as Jessica's about to wrap this up, there are a lot more questions. I apologize that maybe I should have left a little bit more time, but we will answer these questions in writing. We'll make it available to, to Orisher so they can send to everybody who registered. If you have additional questions, send them in. I'll be happy to spend as much time working on those questions so that you get the answers that you want. As you can see, there's a couple of more webinars coming up on April 20th and 27th that you can submit questions for as well. As a registrant for today's webinar, you'll be receiving registration information for those webinars also. But you can contact us directly at Current Consulting Group if you want to ask any questions, or you can contact the, um, the folks at Orisher as well for oral fluid specific questions, and they would be happy to help you. So Jessica, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Bill, for all of that information. Thank you, Orisher, for co-sponsoring this webinar with us today. Um, and thank you for all who have attended today's webinar presentation. As Bill mentioned, we will make sure that questions are answered and that if you continue to have questions, please feel free to reach out to either your Orisher representative or to a representative at Current Consulting Group. One of the questions that popped up throughout the presentation, and we wanted to just reiterate this to you, is that you will receive access to the recording and to the slides from today's presentation. Also, for this presentation, it has been pre-qualified for continuing education credit from SHRM and from CCDAP for those who attended today's entire live presentation. And so we will verify your attendance and send you that information. And we appreciate your attendance in today's webinar. Um, please look forward to that email that will give you links to register for these upcoming events on April 20th and April 27th. These will be short 30-minute webinars, but when we say short, they obviously will still be very impactful and very educational, and we hope to see you at those upcoming events. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, and have a great day.